Hello, bonjour, zdrasvitsi, assalamu alaikum, guten tag, uh, and a big warm welcome to the Knitters Party podcast. I think I forgot a few there, but I think I'm forgetting how to podcast, guys. I'm sorry, it's been about three weeks since my last episode. Uh, just been busy jetting around London. I had some good friends visiting from the United States, so I spent some time with them. And honestly, as much as I've been away for three weeks, I don't even have that much knitting to show this episode, so I'm sorry that it's been a while and that now that I'm here, I don't even have that much exciting stuff, but thanks for spending your time with me anyway. Uh, my name is Megan, the host of the Knitter's Party podcast. You can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Meg311yo. 311 is my favorite band. You can, you know, like them if you like. You don't have to like them if you don't like. But um, let's just jump right into it. Being that this is a party, I'm going to be having some libations today, as, as usual, I guess. Uh, so today I am drinking Prancing Ponies Brewery India Red Ale. Now this is a uh, this is a brewery out of Australia. I want to say I have no idea how I found this in my local um, my local liquor store, but everything that they sell here in the UK is sold as an individual bottle. I have not found a six pack anywhere. So. Cool, you get to kind of mix and match and just buy them loose, buy them single, whatever you like, and I think that's kind of fun. So let's go ahead, crack this bad boy open and start the party. I know I'm ready for the nice long weekend. Here in the UK, it is um, Easter weekend, so we get Friday and Monday off. So my husband is not doing his research uh, Friday and Monday, so we get a fun four day weekend. I'll tell you guys about our plans in a little bit. But if you are celebrating Easter, happy Easter. If you're celebrating Passover, happy Passover. I know that there's sort of a lot of holidays coming up for everybody, and um, no matter whether you're celebrating or not, you can always come and join me for a beer, so you don't even have to have a reason. You're just watching a knitting podcast, right? Cool. All right, let's see how this beer looks. You can tell that I don't really have any appropriate beer glasses uh, in my apartment here, so I'm going to drink out of a nice big wine glass. Cool. The color is a really unfiltered brown red, I guess. I mean, it's an India red ale, so chances are it's going to be sort of higher in alcohol content. I believe it said 7.7%, 7.9% alcohol by volume. And um, this is 2.1 British units of alcohol. So here is my <laughs> happy beer for the day. <laughs> Shit. Oh, well, hey, that's okay. It's my knitting podcast. I'm here. I don't have anywhere to go for the rest of the day. So who cares if I'm drinking an 8% beer? Let's go right into it. Mm. It's a big beer. Woo. Um, you know those beers that just taste like bread? This is kind of one of them. It's not bad. It's just really heavy. I think I'm going to take my time drinking it. I wish I had poured myself a glass of water as well. Oops. Oh, well. Hmm. All right. Let's get into the episode. Some knitting, shall we? First and foremost, oh, before we talk about the knitting, I'm sorry. How do you guys like my hair? I finally dyed it purple. I had been thinking about it for, I want to say, since episode three or episode four of the podcast. Uh, today is episode 11, and I was really looking forward to it. So actually, this is a funny story. So I'm in London. I live in a very diverse neighborhood. I've noticed that there's a lot of, um, there's like a large community of Brazilians, Moroccans, and Indians in my community. So it's kind of a really fun, diverse area. Anyway, I'm walking to the gym one day and I notice that there's a salon right on the corner. I pass by it every single day. I've just never stopped in. So I decide after my gym one day, I'm just gonna go in, talk to them about my hair, let them know sort of what I wanna do. Turns out uh, it is a Brazilian owned, I almost said a Brazilian owned restaurant, a Brazilian owned salon. And you know, he books me for the next day. I get in and I'm so excited because what they what they did basically is sort of bleach my hair so that I'm able to put color on top of it. Um, so I get there and my, my stylist does not speak very much English. And so we're kind of communicating. I'm using my very limited Spanish. He's using his, you know, limited English, but we're getting by. There's people to sort of help. We're having a good time and I like him. He and I kind of have uh, a lot of, a lot of fun rapport together. So that was good. But I guess I didn't exactly, uh, walk out of there with exactly what I had asked for. And so I thought what they were going to do, and maybe this is, 
I, you know, kind of ignorant of me. I'm not a stylist by any means, but I have dyed my own hair a lot over the years. I even had sort of this ombre hair for about two years. I did my own ombre. And so that's what I wanted. I was like, I want the ends to be blonde, everything up to here, I want to be brown. And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Like, I think he understands. He highlighted my whole head. I have highlights up to here. You can see I didn't even get all the purple into it. I've got highlights up to here when I had asked for really just the bottom, you know, five or six inches to be in blonde. Anyway, it was just a funny, hilarious experience. Um, I don't know if I would go back to that same salon, but it has nothing to do with the people because my stylist was awesome. I just felt like I sort of didn't exactly get what I had asked for, but again, I don't know if I asked for something that is just not appropriate or if I asked for something that they just don't do. Whatever, it was hilarious and it ended up being successful because today, in fact, I, I dyed my hair purple and the color took really well. Um, here in America, they have a Schwarzkopf professional hairline for at-home use. So in America, if you want Schwarzkopf color, you have to go to a salon. And my uncle is a, is a hairdresser in the United States, and so I've gone to him for years and years. He's always saying how Schwarzkopf is the only brand he would ever use, etc. So when I go abroad, because Egypt, all over Europe, certainly in the UK, they all have these at-home Schwarzkopf hair color lines. And so this is part of their, I believe it's called Live Color line. They've got blues and greens and purples and pinks and pastels and all the fun colors that you could possibly want. So anyway, it's just cool that here in the UK, we've got more of a selection for sort of home hair care. So I thought that was really fun. Anyway, now I can actually get into the knitting, but I just wanted to show off my brand new hair. And if you see that my fingers are a bit purple today, that's because I literally dyed my hair about an hour before podcasting. So hooray for me. I have purple hair finally. Cheers. Mm -hmm. So what have I been doing for three weeks? Well, I have no finished objects to show. Sorry about that, but let's get right into our works in progress because I have been knitting I've been knitting, yeah, like a, a little bit, but a, but a lot as well. And I guess for three weeks, I don't have too, too much to show, but I'll let you be the judge of that. The first thing I'm going to show here, living in my beautiful peacock project bag that I have, and this is by Nola Delisle, this project bag. I show this sometimes, but maybe not as often as I should awesome project bag. It's like a nice soft fabric. I got it for Christmas this year. And inside I've got my awesome socks that I made some really good progress on. So these are the Hermione's Everyday Sock by the lovely Erica Luder. Everybody knows this pattern. Everybody knows this designer. Everybody knows everything about this. So what can I really have to offer? I mean, realistically, I love it as well. The pattern, it's really not so much of a pattern as a texture. It's stupidly easy. You don't need the pattern for it. So I'm happy that you're kind of able to take whatever toe, whatever heel, whatever, you know, cuff you like. It kind of just gives you guidelines for what they recommend. And the actual textured pattern on here is fun. It doesn't feel like too much. It doesn't feel like it's going to irritate your skin. There's no holes in it, so it's not lacy. It's not going to be cold. Um, but yeah, I think it's really nice. So the last time I showed these socks, I was up to that stitch marker. Of course, I'm working um, toe up. Is it toe up or toe down? It's cuff down, toe up. Yeah. So I'm working these socks two at a time, toe up on my awesome Magic Loop needles here. And these needles are just nitpicks. They're not interchangeable. This one I did order a fixed set because I I know that they don't sell. They're interchangeable in really small needle sizes. So those US ones, twos, I think up to three, they don't sell in interchangeables, which is totally fine. So I just picked up, I wanna say this is a 47 inch cord, which is, for me, my cord can't be too big for magic loop. So I know that there are some people who like really small loops when they're you know knitting back and forth, but especially I specifically bought these for two at a time socks. So I need enough room for I don't know, maybe eight inches across of actual knitting plus loop room. So that's just my preferred is 47 inches. Sometimes I could do 60 inches, but that might get a bit floppy, but I'd rather have floppy, you know, ends on my magic loop rather than having not enough 
and then things pull or they, you know, give me a ladder at the end of my work, whatever, I'm over it. So I've done a, quite a bit of progress. And for somebody who, at least for me, I am not a sock knitter, I think this is really good progress. Um, a little bit about the yarn. I am using two caked up balls, but this is just one 100 gram skein that was sort of caked up into two more or less 50 gram balls. I totally eyeballed it, so I don't know what they actually weighed when I wound them up. But this is Knit Picks Hawthorne in their Goose Hollow colorway. And I mentioned, I think last time, maybe the time before, I mentioned that I had made a cowl for my good friend Brittany out of the same yarn. I don't recommend this yarn for next to skin projects. I mean, socks are next to your skin officially, but you get the idea. This is not a super soft sock yarn. This is 75-25, you know, I don't even know if it's merino. It might just be wool, superwash wool and nylon, but it's a bit scratchy. It's a bit, how do they say it? Woolen? Is that is that the, you know, adjective that I'm supposed to be using for scratchy wool is that it's, it's rustic, it's woolen. No, it's a bit scratchy, to be honest. It does soften up a bit with use and with, um, with washing, but I would definitely never use this again for a cowl. And I feel bad because I, wanted to give this to my colleague Brittany before I went off to Egypt and all sorts of stuff. I sort of set a deadline for myself and I should have really just purchased a bit higher quality yarn, a bit softer yarn. It doesn't even have to be higher quality or more expensive by any means. It just, I, I wish I had given her a softer yarn because I don't think she's even able to wear it. So sorry, Brittany, <laughs> I will do better next time, I guess. Anyway, so that is for the sock. The heels is Knit Picks Capretta, which is an MCN Merino Cashmere Nylon, uh, just in their black colorway, of course. And I like it. So let me tell you my sort of my experience with working specifically with this MCN Capretta yarn for socks, because I had made another pair of socks. If you go back to maybe episode two or three, I had finished my, um, Oh, shoot. They're like a space themed sock. Anyway, I'd finished another sock out of the same combination of Knit Picks Hawthorne and Knit Picks Capretta. And the socks turned out wonderful. But the way that you do two at a time socks, when you're doing something like a toe or specifically a heel where you are working in short rows, but you have two identical heels that you're trying to make. The way that I learned how to do it is that you basically, you know, do your short row across. So let's say you're knitting 15 rows and then you wrap and turn, right? The way that you would get from this sock to the next sock is that you slip all the rest of the stitches that are in the heel that have already been wrapped and turned. So you just slip those so that those go onto your working needle so that you're kind of done with that so that you're able to work on the next heel. You just slip them all. Now, what I learned with the last pair of socks is that when you slip these stitches and then you go back and you slip, you know, the stitches on the other side and then you have to slip all of these stitches again before you're able to work back across the row. So you're basically slipping only one side of each sock because let's say you start from this side, right? This is your, your working side. You have to knit this way and then knit you know, go back the other way you came. And then you go on to your next sock where you work from this to here. And if you, basically you end up slipping several stitches on each half, sort of the inside half of your heels. So let's say you've got your two heels here. You know, you're working back and forth, but of course you need to get just this, you know, teeny tiny little peek at the end of your you know, your heel here, right? So you're supposed to slip all of these and slip all of these to get back here, slip them, slip them, work, slip them, slip them, work, slip them, slip them, work, right? And when I made my heel, and you do the same thing for the toes, by the way, but when I had done the heel on my last pair of socks, the slipped stitches got matted, they got felted already, and when you're trying to pick up those wraps and knit them, especially if you're trying to knit them without holes and, and sort of in a special way, you're manipulating stitches or anything, you end up with sort of a felted sticky stitch and it doesn't feel good, it doesn't look good because on, you know, on one side only, just on sort of the inside 
of your heels, it's only one side that's matted. And then the other side, sort of on the outside of your sock, is totally fine. It's perfect. You don't see anything. It doesn't have any matting. It doesn't have any um, um, felted pieces, nothing. So anyway, what I did with these is I have worked the foot and I'm working the leg. There we go. I'm working the leg of the sock, you know, two at a time. But when it came to making the heels and making the toes, I'm doing them one at a time. And then I'm basically, what I did is I just sort of finished my heel. If I had slitches, st uh, if I had stitches to slip, I just slipped one row and then I was able to work on my next heel, no problem. I didn't have to worry about sort of those matted stitches. So if that's something that's maybe keeping you away from trying two at a time socks, if you're worried about sort of the slipping aspect of your toes and heels, you don't have to do that. And I know that a lot of people, um, especially for example, there's like the afterthought everything sock where you make afterthought heels and toes. You know, you can definitely sort of adopt your knitting technique to make it work for you. But anyway, I thought I've made great progress. Um, on the bottom of my sock, I just did a three by one rib to give it a bit more tension, sort of. I want it to be really tight across the bottom of my foot. Um, but yeah, I hope to get these finished soon, especially because I've got a couple of things in the works that I want to start knitting. And with April being here, with May and the summertime coming up, um, I really want to finish any warm weather project that I'm making, like socks, and kind of focus more on some cool weather knitting projects. And I'm hoping maybe next time to have like a segment on warm weather knitting, because I don't love knitting sweaters. I say that, but then I knit my huge giant sweater when I was living in Egypt, where it's, you know, 95 degrees and sunny every day. I knit a stole when, it, when I was in Egypt. I knit a lot of cold weather projects when I was living in the desert of Egypt. So I might just be, I don't know. Point is, I'm trying to focus more on things that I can actually wear in the summertime. And I don't know how I'm going to feel about hand knit socks. They might just be bedtime socks, but we'll see. So anyway, this is my first work in progress. I am really happy about these. Also, I don't think you can even tell on camera. The, the color is a bit variegated. There's purples and blues and sort of softer pastel versions of them in this ball. But I do notice that this one, this sock has more purple than this one. I don't know if you can, sh if you, it'll show up well on camera, but I'm almost concerned because I had initially, when I was making that um, scarf, when I was making that cowl for my friend Brittany, I had bought two skeins of this yarn and I was alternating skeins at one point. And I realized that was a stupid idea because it wouldn't even take a single skein of yarn, let alone two skeins to make this cowl. And so I sort of sliced one of them, kept it, which is what I think these two balls are, but I want, I don't know if, if they're actually alter, like different balls of yarn. I feel like they would be more different if they were actually two different skeins, but I noticed that my socks are a bit different and this theoretically came from the same skein of, of yarn. So I'm not a hundred percent. Doesn't this one look more dark, like more blue or I'm sorry, more purple compared to that one? Maybe like, let me turn it upside down in case it's the lighting. No, I definitely think this top one is slightly different. It's, I don't know. I have no idea. So anyway, that's part of the magic, you know? I'm just knitting these socks, and if they're sisters instead of identical twins, that's okay with me. Cool. <laughs> so that's my first work in progress. I do have another work in progress. Um, living in my awesome project bag, courtesy of Ziploc. Thanks. And, oh no, the way I put this back is going to be a pain in the butt. This is my Mirajan cardigan by Marianne Mounier, the French designer, Marianne, uh, Marianne Mounier. And I have made so much progress on this. I'm really proud of myself. So I'm going to untangle it for one second and show you my amazing progress. <laughs> now I think I've hyped up the moment. You guys aren't even going to see like anything different. Basically, I have separated the sleeves of this project. There we go. 
I've separated for the sleeves and I've added, I've started a new lace pattern on the front of this cardigan. So that little stitch marker is where I was last time I showed it. And I think I've made some really good progress. So I've done about four inches. And if you've ever done a raglan style sweater, you know that bef just before you uh, you sort of take the sleeves off the main knitting and you start with the bodywork, you have the most stitches that you're ever gonna have on your needles for this project. And so every inch of project probably gained, you know, 16 stitches, because it's one here, one here, on on the other side, and both, uh, I'm sorry, on the, you know, left and right shoulders. So you're gaining eight stitches each, every other round. So it, it adds up really quickly. Anyway, I have separated the sleeves and done maybe about an inch and a half of work, maybe two inches even. That's looking good. And I'm really excited about this project. I think it's going to look super good once I finally finish it and cast off. And it'll be just in time for me to go back to Egypt to live in Cairo. So a nice wool sweater. Doesn't that sound lovely? You know, I don't know why I do this to myself. I really should just be knitting like socks and or cotton and or, you know, warm weather fi fabrics, fi uh, fibers, whatever. I'm over it. So a little bit about this pattern. As mentioned last time, it has a sort of staggering lace effect on the front of the sweater. So you start off with two lace repeats at the top of your sweater. And this is, um, it's also an asymmetrical sweater. So instead of the line going straight down the middle, your sweater sort of comes over on one side and your buttons are on the left side of your body. So it's really cool. I love the asymmetrical look of it. I love the lace of it, everything. You start off with two lace repeats, one and two, and then you, after two repeats of the lace, you add a third. After two more repeats, you add a fourth. So I've just barely started my third pattern repeat down here. You can see it's only about four, four rows in, but I just love it because you can kind of see, let me like throw this over my shoulder, kind of give a, oh, there we go, better view this down but you can see it kind of goes over 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 and it creates this step ladder look throughout the body of your cardigan so I'm really happy with this project especially for something that is such a warm I'm sorry a cold weather knit I kind of like mix those two up because in cold weather you need warmer clothes and in warm weather you need cooler clothes but you call it cold weather knitting or warm weather knitting or you can call it warm knitting like if you're knitting for something warm I'm just all sorts of confused today. This is what happens when I take three weeks off. I'm sorry, guys. Anyway, I think it looks really nice. I've made some awesome progress, and I am sort of just zooming along now because I took off. I think each sleeve had like 98 stitches or something, so there's 200 stitches of not knitting every single round. Oh, I'm just really excited by this project. Um, also, a reminder about the yarn. This is my mystery yarn that my friend Liz had given me in San Diego before I left uh, for my international journey, so to say. And I've got five skeins already caked up of this mystery green yarn. It is a two-ply wool. I don't think it's super wash. I think it's just a two-ply wool fingering weight yarn. And I'm alternating three skeins right now. So that's about the end of that project. And... I've been probably knitting the most on this because I've, I've been seeing slow progress. You know, when you knit socks, it's like, you know, you sit down for an hour and you've got a couple inches done, you're good. But when you sit down for a cardigan, you don't see that progress as fast. So I'm just like, no, I want to say that in one week I knit four inches or in two weeks I knit, you know, I, I separated the sleeves, for example. Like I kind of like those milestones that come with a garment, uh, perhaps more so than if those milestones are with a sock. It just makes me feel a bit more accomplished. But anyway, that's that. Cool. As for my last work in progress, which will be frogged, um, disclaimer, this 
project makes me really sad. It doesn't make me sad. It's just like unfortunate because I don't like it. I'll just get into it. This little puny thing is the beginnings of a Kalara shawl, which is a beautiful shawl. I recommend that you, you know, look it up on Ravelry if you're in the market for a shawl. I specifically chose it because I have these awesome cakes of complementary yarn, so they're not high contrast by any means. Um, and I chose this pattern because it looked really good in the, the, the model one or like the designer, the completed Kalara shawl that the designer made was using two colors of complementary greens and it just looked really beautiful. I think she just chose the right colors. Oh my God. It was just absolutely amazing. So I bought the pattern. I was really happy, but when I started knitting it, I could not get over how ugly this looks doesn't it look kind of like a carnival or like oh no, like I'm going to McDonald's or something I just don't like this color combination I think it looks bad together you know and this is just clearly like two rows each so just back and forth and then you switch colors back and forth I just don't like it and so I can't continue knitting it and what's funny is I started this project on March 28th and I knew immediately, I mean, clearly I knew immediately, this is what, a half hour of knitting? I knew immediately that I wanted to frog it, that I just hated this pattern. I'm sorry, I hated my color choices for the pattern. The pattern is well written. It is a paid for pattern. So I paid, I think like $6 for this pattern. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to make another one because I don't know the right color combination to do it. Because if this doesn't work, if this color combination doesn't work, I don't know what to do. So a little bit about the colors. Um, these are two skeins of yarn that I bought when I was in Austin, Texas, uh, before we came out to London. We just took a quick trip to Austin, Texas. That's where my husband and I met at the University of Texas, hook em horns. Um, but anyway, I of course went to a local yarn shop there in Austin. And this is Yarn Carnival is the company. This color is called Endless Summer. This color is Love. And I bought them because they looked so good together. I didn't have a project in mind, which shame on me, but I had to have this. It's a gorgeous yarn. It's 100% merino. Um, it is a three or four ply, um, but it's a thin, it's a thin fingering weight. It's gorgeous. It's delicate. It's beautiful. It's soft. It's lightweight. It's so squishy. It's like the perfect yarn, which is why it can't be in this sad project. Doesn't this kind of look like a man thong right now? Like it's kind of, <laughs> I feel like it's got this like bulge here, you know, for like man stuff. And then there you go. I, I just made a little G string. Perfect. If I had a Ken doll or something, I'd make a G string. Anyway, it's definitely a banana hammock at this point. Ha! Yes, I knit a banana hammock. Oh, I should maybe continue this and give it to my husband. <laughs> Here's your wool banana hammock G string thong, Paul. Oh God, he would kill me <laughs> if he ever sees this episode. Oh, he's going to kill me. Anyway, it does look like a little banana hammock, a little man thong. So, hey, maybe the Kalara shawl is for you. If you've got that special man in your life, you're looking for a sexy, fun project to make out of your spare yarn. Might I recommend cotton? I would not recommend 100% merino wool. But hey, what can be softer against sensitive skin? Am I right? So got my little banana hammock. Actually, that makes me happy. You know, I was really unhappy with this project, but now I can laugh about it a little bit and, um, you know, kind of just chuckle about it. So anyway, this failed project brings me to the next segment I'm going to do, which is my dream knitting, because clearly I cannot let this incredible yarn go to waste. Doesn't this just look like a birthday cake of yarn? Oh my God. I just love it. Anyway, um, <laughs> So I got to rip out this banana hammock. I'm going to reuse the yarn. And I think what I'm going to do is crochet another project. And I say it kind of like that because my friend Jaden of the, oh, oh my God, I didn't even announce we have winners for our cheap cow. I'll do that at the end. Um, but the, the winners have already been contacted. So you guys know who you are. Um, I apologize for not announcing that in the very beginning of the show, but we did pull winners for our cheap cow. Thank you guys for 
participating. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So sorry. Oh my God. What was I thinking? Anyway, Jaden of the Pearl Up and Die podcast with whom I co-hosted this, you know, cheap cow knit along. She just put out a new episode of her podcast and she is crocheting an incredible project and it looks really gorgeous. I know how to crochet. I, I'm, a, I'm a good crocheter. I'm, I'm better at knitting by far, but I'm a good crocheter. So anyway, Jaden um, was crocheting this project and it really inspired me to crochet a project. So with this yarn, I'm going to be making the Halloweb shawl by Mandabug Crafts. Hmm. It's kind of a mouthful. And the shawl, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna pop a picture in because I finally learned how to do that. Okay. at editing videos but that's okay I didn't go to college for that um anyway the shawl is incredible it's got sections of some really light lace work um or even just regular crochet and then sections in your your color b of really open lace crochet work and it looks gorgeous and at the end it's got sort of this fun thing that you can only do with crochet you cannot knit it so you have to crochet it where at the end of the shawl it's you know a crescent shawl and it has these little pillars at the end um little peaks sort of so to speak yeah there's like these little v-shaped peaks which are sort of made in this really beautiful filigree so i think that that would be a fun warm weather knit it would be cool and light and breathable because there's tons of lace it is crocheted so it's going to be a bit lighter anyway um and the colors that they used in their sample are also complementary contrasting colors so anyway it just looks like this would be a great combination because you've got large bands of this color and then you're able to break it up with sort of this whiter um you know variegated color i just think that's going to be a winner so i can't wait to try it out and i'm so looking forward to casting on it is another paid for pattern so it kind of sucks that i'm going to pay two times for this one project <laughs> thus is life um <laughs> I had somebody ask me if I would do like a little um, learn Arabic sort of thing section and it, this yarn sort of reminded me of just a famous um, saying in Arabic and it's yom asal yom basal and it is you know one day is honey one day is onions it's sort of you got to take the good with the bad yom asal yom basal and so the the idea of this this being my yom asal yom basal project. <laughs> Okay, see, I, it's already like turning itself around. You know, the energy is definitely turned around. This was my like, oh, it doesn't look good project. But now it's my like man thong and Arabic proverb project. I can get with that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm really excited to try that out. So I think I will be not casting on. I'm going to just be starting this crochet project soon. And I think it's going to be very worthwhile. So the other thing that I can't wait to start knitting and going along with my dream knitting segment is I have to cast this on now, like immediately. I dyed my hair today and the first thing I thought about was this gorgeous, you know, sort of water lily green color. And I picked out this shirt immediately and then I saw this in my cabinet because this is this is more front and center than my clothing. Like all my yarn, I don't have that much, but the yarn that I do have is sort of on display in my um, <laughs> in my husband's closet. I have like one little, two, three little shelves for my knitting and all my little knitting accessories. But I've been waiting to cast this on. I don't know what I was thinking, waiting on it, um, but this was a very special skein of yarn that, again, Jaden of the Pearl of and Dye podcast um, her and her sister have a yarn company, Midnight Cravings, and she hand dyed this skein of yarn for me because before we even did this cheap cal, her and I were just, you know, chatting. We were, you know, saying what, what we have so much in common just with, you know, knitting with budget yarns and we started getting talking, whatever. The next episode that I saw from her is that her and her sister had started a yarn company and so I immediately went out and purchased a skein of yarn. 
And she contacted me a few days later and she's like, you brat, you didn't have to buy a skein of yarn, you know, whatever. And I was like, of course, if you can't support your friends, who can you support realistically, right? So she threw this in for me and this is a hand dyed just for me skein of yarn called It's a Party After All for the Knitter's Party Podcast. I think this is a one of a kind skein. It just means so much to me and I was looking for the right project. And I had mentioned this several episodes ago, and uh, one of my awesome viewers, who is super awesome, Amaranti, you know who you are. You're awesome. You are always so active in our Revelry forums. I know you participated in our Cheap Cal, and you sent me the pattern that I am going to make with this skein of yarn. It is called the Ginger Leaves Shawl. The designer is Christina Wall, and it's a really beautiful one skein little shawlette. Uh, it's right up against the skin. It's a small project. It has lots of lace. It is a beautiful, beautiful project, and I cannot wait to make it with this beautiful, beautiful yarn that so complements my new purple hair. It's like all the stars are aligning, and like now is the time when I can make this project. So thank you, Amaranti, for the uh, suggestion to make the Ginger Leaves Shawl. A very big thank you out to Jaden for this incredible skein of yarn. Um, it means a lot to me, and so this project will be special. So anyway, just thank you. Um, it makes me feel loved. It makes me feel really positive and happy inside, uh, knowing that I've got sort of people all over that are supporting me, you know, and that's what this whole community is about. The knitting community is about the fact that I can live in London. I don't know anybody and I can have a whole network of people who are like-minded to me. So I just it just never stops blowing my mind how incredible and how generous this whole knitting community is. And, and with the podcast world, it allows you to touch base with people on a different level. So anyway, thank you guys. And I can't wait to start that Ginger Leaves Shawlette. Yay! Okay, for my last section today, um, I had opened up a Ravelry thread in my Knitter's Party podcast Ravelry group called Ask Me Anything, and I've had a ton of questions submitted, um, and so I am going to answer a few more of those questions. So thank you for anyone who's asked a question, who's submitted something. If you have a question you'd like to ask me, please do. Um, nothing is really off topic. If it's super off topic, maybe I'll send you a private message and, and answer your question directly, but I don't know if I'd answer it in the podcast. But nothing is really um, too sensitive. Now I feel like I'm just opening a can of worms that I don't really want to deal with. Anyway, so the first question posed by Knit Nerd. Cheers to you, Knit Nerd. Uh, she was asking about my ring. And she had mentioned that, um, I believe she said her birthday is in November, and so she... Her birthstone is a yellow topaz, but she's heard it's citrine, she's heard it's, you know, whatnot, etc. And she noticed that my ring is along the same color lines as the November birthstone. And so she was asking me sort of about my ring. Is it a wedding ring? Is it a birthstone? You know, sort of what, how did I end up with this ring on my hand? And so this is my wedding ring. It was also my engagement ring. This is the ring that my now husband gave to me when we got engaged six and a half years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we had talked about getting married. We had talked about it for a long time. You know, he knew that I wanted to and, and I knew he wanted to. And so it was kind of just about figuring out some logistics. And I told him, I said, you know what? I, if you're gonna buy me a ring, I don't want a diamond. As you can tell, I'm kind of a colorful person. I like colorful, like if you've read my Ravelry thing, I'm like, I like colorful beer, colorful yarn, and colorful people. Like, I just like color. My life is colorful. And to me, a clear stone with a diamond, it just doesn't hold meaning in my life necessarily. And, and had he given me a diamond wedding ring, I think that would have been amazing. It would have been beautiful. Absolutely, I would have accepted it. But I specifically told him that I did not want a diamond. I just thought that with my personality and with our relationship, I, I, I thought we were really special. I, I still think that we're a special couple. I wanted something special to kind of go with it, right? So he 
I, I kind of gave him some guidelines too. I was like, I want a stone that's either orange or green um, because those are just two of my favorite colors. And he went shopping with his mother, smart man, um, and came out with this. There we go. That is a fleur de lis filigree on the sides. And I took seven years of French in high school. So the fleur de lis, uh, seven years of French in middle school, high school. Uh, and so the fleur de lis kind of is just a symbol of French and of travel. And it, to me, it sort of holds a different meaning than, you know, it's not necessarily like the French Revolution, you know, fraternity, etc like Liberty Fraternity, whatever. And anyway, so it's white gold with um, the fleur de lis filigree. And then this is a citrine. And it's a pretty big rock. And he was like, well, for the price that I was looking at, I could either get, you know, a very small diamond, or I could get a giant rock citrine. So he chose the giant citrine rock, um, which I'm, a, I'm not a small person. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a full-size woman, I guess. Um, and so anyway, like having a large stone, I think it works really well for me. Anyway, he also says, that's how I knew you were the one is when you you asked for a non-diamond wedding ring. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's the story with my ring. The reason I only have one is we decided when we got married, because this was when we got engaged, um, you know, he gave this to me. And for the wedding, he was like, well, do you want another ring, like a wedding ring? And we thought about it, and this is a standalone piece, um, and so I just decided I didn't need another another ring for the wedding. So that's that. As for his ring, his ring is yellow gold with black diamonds across the front of it. It's kind of like at an asymmetrical angle, these black diamonds across, you know, one part of the ring. It's a really nice looking ring, so maybe I'll be able to show it one day when he's not wearing it. Awesome. Thanks for the question. And that is definitely not too personal because she was like, oh, you know, I was I don't know if this is too personal to ask, but I noticed your wedding ring. Anyway, so um, the next question comes from my fan, Amaranti, and I'm a fan of you too. Uh, and she asked if I have a favorite local yarn shop in London. So shame on me. I have not gone yarn shopping in London yet. I've been out and about and I've sort of looked for yarn, but I've been, for example, I went to Camden Market with my good friend Rose, who just came in from Michigan, um, and her and I went shopping, and I was like, okay, maybe if I find a yarn shop, like, I'll find one. We didn't end up finding one, no big deal. Also, I think I mentioned a couple episodes ago that the way we get paid on my husband's stipend is that we get paid at the end of the month after we've paid all the bills for that month, so we're kind of barely catching up to our expenses. And so I have not had the opportunity to really go to any local yarn shops in London. I do plan, however, before I leave, because I'm here for another four months in the UK, before I leave, I want to go yarn shopping and I want to take a haul with me to Egypt because when we go to Cairo after finishing up in London, we're going to Cairo for six to eight months and then we're possibly going to the Sudan for one month for more research. We're possibly going to be traveling a bit more after that for vacation, etc. I need eight months worth of knitting, and that's a lot of yarn. So I definitely plan to have a shopping spree before I leave London because British wool is well known, <laughs> shall I say. I also plan to get quite a bit of cotton yarn just because I'm going to be in the Middle East. I'm going to be in the desert in Cairo for eight months, and it's going to be hot, and I'm not going to want to knit with just wool. So we'll see. Anyway... Cool. Thanks, Amaranti. Um, one more question. Rachel SF asked about my travel and, you know, she likes to hear about my travel experiences, etc. And so she was asking if I could pick one favorite place that I've traveled to, one in the U.S. and one abroad, what would I recommend? And I had to think about this. I really had to think hard about this. I think in terms of my favorite place that I've ever visited in America, um, I went to Copper Harbor, Michigan, which is at the very tip top of the Keweenaw Peninsula of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So um, Michigan sort of has the Lower Peninsula, which looks like a hand, and then sort of this Upper Peninsula, which looks like a rabbit. This Upper Peninsula has another peninsula called the Keweenaw Peninsula way up here. And at the very tip top of that, the most northern point in Michigan is Copper Harbor, Michigan. It's a one road town 
but it is filled with a community of people who are so in touch with nature and their spirituality and I went with a friend of mine who is very near and dear to my heart and we met up with our, our third friend who had lived there, that was the reason we went, and I just had sort of a weekend of spiritual and and personal exploration. We spent a ton of time doing crafts. I made an amazing dream catcher. We spent time kayaking um, up in Lake Superior. We just had an amazing time hiking and, you know, eating super local food and oh my god, it was just incredible the experience that I had there. And so the reason Copper Harbor is my favorite place in America is because or the play, favorite place that I've visited, realistically, my favorite place in America is probably San Diego, but favorite place I've visited, Copper Harbor, Michigan, it is a place to really get in touch with yourself and to do a bit of soul searching. My friend and I are big crafters, and so we spent hours crafting, working with beads, we made bracelets, we made dream catchers, we were, I did knitting, we did crochet. I mean, we just spent a weekend in touch with our, our bodies and our hands and our craft and our spirits and everything. It was really incredible. So that's the best place I've ever visited in America. Also, they're known for hiking and outdoor sports. If you like biking, um, hiking, tons of water sports because it's right on Lake Superior. Um, we went through this cave. So we were kayaking through a cave. Oh my God. It was just in insane. And Lake Superior is incredible. The water is so clear. You, you can almost drink it. Um, oh, it was, it was a really amazing experience. And so that's, that's it for America. As for abroad, my favorite place I've ever been to abroad is Italy. Um, back when I was 12 years old, my family did a big Mediterranean cruise where we hit Spain, France, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. And we spent three days in Italy, um, one day each in Pompeii, Venice, and... Rome, there we go, Pompeii, Venice, and Rome, and the whole country is so amazing. It's filled with history. I mean, ancient Rome is part of the reason that we have modern society the way we do. You know, if you're looking at, at ancient civilizations, we've got the Roman Empire, we've got the Greek Empire, and both of those reasons are, or both of those historical times are so influential on modern Western civilization and culture. And you see a ton of that in Rome. Not only that, but of course the food is amazing. We had some awesome tours, tour guides, and um, specifically with Pompeii, the story of Pompeii is that this is a city that was destroyed by a volcano. And a volcano nearby um, Mount Vesuvius erupted, coating the city in ash. And it preserved the city so well. And the the exhibits that they have on display are, you know, people who were the people that died in their homes because of smoke inhalation and things. And so you see these casts of people who died, you know, covering up their baby's face, you know, who died crouching, hiding their own face, shielding their face. As, as morbid as it is, it's a really incredible slice of history and time. Not to mention that when I was a kid, I had a book about sort of natural disasters in like around the world and Pompeii was one of them that I just found fascinating. I don't know why I, I, I don't, whatever. I just had this book and it was called disaster. And so they had the Hindenburg, they had the Titanic, they had the San Francisco earthquake of the 1950s. They had, um, you know, Pompeii, Italy, they had all these disasters that just killed a bunch of people, but it fascinated me as a kid. And so seeing the actual city of Pompeii was a real cool connection to sort of my, my, childhood interest in that sort of thing. All right, last question that I'm going to answer from the Ask Me Anything chat uh, is a question asked by Dillback, and they asked about, they asked if I had sort of any European travel planned while I'm living in London. And of course, the short answer is yes. Um, while we are in the UK for this study, I think we're going to try and save as much money as we can, especially because we haven't even been able to sort of live on what we have right now just because we get paid at the end of the month and we had to pay rent early and we're sort of catching up to ourselves. So we don't have a ton of liquid income right now, but we're hoping that once our you know monthly expenses sort of catch up to our spending, um, we'll be able to save quite a bit of money and we're hoping to do a huge European vacation after we are done in London. So um, ideally we would love to 
basically go west to east. This is okay. This is like our big idea. Realistically, we're not going to have the money or time to do this, but if I had my way, we would want to start west east and we would start in like Morocco. We would spend a day in Morocco, then go north to Spain and then literally train across Europe, hitting France and Germany and Belgium and Amsterdam and I'm sorry, the Netherlands and Switzerland and Austria and Czech Republic and Hungary and Ukraine and Poland. We would want to see every country. Realistically, I have to see Germany. That is my number one country that I want to visit in the whole wide world. Um, and so if we can't do a three week European tour, I think we might end up um, kind of going west to east, maybe Spain, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands. I think that's like the minimum that we would really do and that we would really actually have the time and the resources to do. So I am super excited. However, on a shorter term scale, my cousin is coming to London to visit us. Um, her and I are just really good friends and she's my cousin and we love each other so much and we get along so well. We're about the same age. We both have the same like rambunctious energetic style. Um, she's just like me. Maybe I'll bring her on the podcast. <gasps> that would be fun. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. She is coming to London and she wants to visit Paris. And so I think with my seven years of incredible French that I learned in high school and middle school, cheers, I might go to Paris with her and we can spend a couple of days eating cheese and drinking wine and going to the Eiffel Tower and just spending time in Paris, darling. So I think that's going to have to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for everyone who submitted a question to the Ask Me Anything thread on Ravelry. Um, like I mentioned, if you've got a question that you'd like to ask me, go ahead, jet over to our Knitters Party Podcast Ravelry group and let me know. And I'll do my best to, you know, answer your question on my, on my next episode. Cool. All right. For my last segment, and I cannot believe I didn't mention this earlier, the cheap cal has come to a close. Uh, we had incredible reception by so many people saying that they so appreciated us having a knit along for budget based yarn. We had a hun hundreds of entries into our both the chatter thread as well as the finished objects and work in progress pictures thread. And we just had a great time hosting this knit along. We do think we're going to do it again sometime. Um, probably not super duper soon just because we you know, just recently finished this knit along. So we're going to give it a bit of time to sort of marinate with you guys. But we, we had such a fun time doing this that we really want to do it again. So as for our winners, our first place winner who won a $25 gift card to knitpicks.com website is and was number 14, Rebecca. So Rebecca, we've already reached out to you and I believe you already have your Knit Picks uh, gift certificate. So happy shopping and you know, we look forward to hopefully seeing you enter again if we host this another time. So that was our first place winner. Our second place winner was Kara Parkman, who received a free pattern of her choice. I'm sorry, she received a pattern of her choice that we gifted to her on Ravelry, and she chose the Campside Cardi, uh, which is such a beautiful cardigan, and I think it was a really great choice. So um, congratulations to the both of you. Thank you to everybody who entered, who participated, who sent pictures. We had such an array of projects submitted to this. So we had everything from socks to cardigans to blankets to pretty much everything across the board. Um, you guys were awesome. I hope that you had a great time with this knit along as much as we did. And we definitely look forward to seeing it again. Cool. On that note, I am out for the day. Cheers. I will see you guys next time. No promises as to when it's going to be because um, clearly I can't stick to my promises when I said I would do this every week. But hopefully maybe I'll have a finished objects next time I, I podcast. So cool. Thanks again. My name is Megan. Feel free to add me on Ravelry and Instagram as Meg311yo. Jet over to my Knitter's Party podcast Ravelry group and join the conversations that we've got going right now. And um, just have a good time. Live well. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye, guys.